Okay, what we'll do today is look at some I.O. devices, relatively, hopefully relatively easy uh, lecture, and then some storage devices, kind of a review of some of the stuff that, that we did earlier. The objectives, learn about the general approaches you need when, to take when installing supporting I.O. devices and mass storage devices. The general approach that you need to take is do whatever the documentation says. Some of them say, plug the device in and then add the driver. Some of them say, put the drivers in and then add the device. The printers now, USB printers, or at least the last one that I installed, said, plug it in and turn it off and start the driver, and then, as it takes forever to get there, at some point in time, it says, now turn the printer on. So it can detect the printer and put the drivers in. So. The devices themselves, mostly we come up with plug and play. Uh, I've been having an issue, obviously, with this with this uh, Bluetooth dongle that I'm trying to use here. It detects the dongle, and then it puts in a driver that it's really not because it's detecting it wrong. Take the driver out, restart the system, then it seems to seems to work a little bit better. How to install and configure several I/O devices such as barcode readers biometric devices, digital cameras, webcams, graphic tablets, and touchscreens. Digital cameras and webcams, every one that I've plugged in, it says, okay, here, it's there. They can have, may have drivers for them. Tablets are probably going to have. Touchscreen's kind of an interesting thing because you can buy a kit to convert a regular monitor to a touchscreen monitor, which is kind of a neat thing to do. Because what the touchscreen uses is a grid, and what it does is puts the grid on the screen, so that when you touch it, it it, it becomes the mouse action. How to install and configure adapter cards? Again, mostly plug and play. Uh, Windows has become much much smarter over the years, and it will go and find many, won't say all of, but many of the drivers that you're going to need. Supporting video subsystems, selecting a monitor video card, supporting dual monitors and video memory. Dual monitors, <clears throat> the first time I tried dual monitors, probably in Windows 95 maybe, uh, XP, but it's not as easy as it is now. Basically now you plug it in and it's they're there and you just would you designate which one you want to be your primary. And I you know you've got multiple monitors on your system. Four monitors, but the multiple monitor arrangement is much, much easier now than it used to be. You do have to have the video cards. We tried it in here a couple of times. The video, I don't remember what it was with the video card. It was something really strange. But with the onboard video, uh, when you plug in a video card in some operating, some motherboards, many motherboards, most motherboards don't know what the answer is to that really. It disables the onboard video. So you actually have to have a video card that will support two monitors or two video cards or three or whatever you have. What I did, and we'll talk about the connectors here in a few minutes at home, bought a video card that had a DVI analog connector as well as a VGA and so I can use both of those ports because I have a monitor that supports each and that way I can have the dual monitors. Uh, I like having that because it really is handy in a working environment where you can have something that you're looking at over here as a, with the documents. You can look up stuff on the internet, put it in your documents. You can look at your spreadsheet. You can look at one Word document, put stuff into the other Word document. A number of advantages being able to do that. The I.O. devices, internal or external, <clears throat> internal obviously are the ones that are supported on the motherboard itself. External is something that we're going to configure. Internal, external, plug it into the outside of the machine, put an internal uh, card into the system itself. The fundamental principles, nothing mystical, magical here. Every device is controlled by software. The driver. If we have the wrong driver, we really have an issue, and we got this little cool little exclamation point that tells us that we're not got the right one. Do we want to go find a better one? And go to, and it will try it. Windows 7 at least will try to search the internet for that. And I've had it sometimes. Didn't have one. Didn't have one. And all of a sudden, it pops up. Got a new driver for you. So I kept looking for it. 
Best guide for installation and support the manufacturer's uh, documentation, whatever we're using there. Some devices need application software. We need the whatever is going to support it to be running in order for it to work. No faster than the port or slot, or slot it's designated for. <clears throat> if we plug a slow USB device, fast USB device into a slow slot, it's going to be a slow USB device. It's kind of like if you're working on the highway. If you're driving a Lotus on the Blue Ridge Parkway where the speed limit is 45 miles an hour and they patrol it pretty heavily, then you've got a 45 mile an hour car, even though it has a capability to go to 160 or whatever the top end is on those things. Use the administrator account in Windows. Windows 7, actually back to Windows Vista, the one that we really love to hate, uh, runs with an account typically that has administrative authority but is not an administrator, which is a good thing from the standpoint of getting viruses and doing things that you really don't want it to do. You get the user uh, account control pop up and say, did you do this? And if you didn't do this, don't say yes. So a lot of people just get in the habit of clicking yes. Don't, don't do that. But use the administrator account. You can right-click things, run as, right-click the command prompt, run as administrator, so that you can still be a non-administrator most of the time and run as an administrator when you need to do that. Problem solved by updating, dr updating drivers. Yes, that can be the case. Install only one device at a time. When you put them in, do them one at a time. I think Windows will only install one at a time. If you try to install the second one or uninstall the second one, it says, oh, something's going on, and please wait until this one's done. The reason you only want to do one at a time is if something doesn't work and you put two or three devices and you don't know which one has the issue. One of the troubleshooting things that happens here with one of our guys has been doing this for a long time. When he gets a machine that doesn't work, the first thing he does is take everything out and then put the devices in one at a time. And when you get to the one that doesn't work, that's the one that the problem is with. So that is that is a one-at-a-time troubleshooting thing. The uh, Action Center and the Device Manager, if we have an issue, the no driver found here for this one, it will show up in the Action Center. And if we look at the Action Center on this machine, I, hopefully it's going to say that there's no real issues. If I can actually find the Action Center on here, the little flag Action Center, no current issues detected. We can open it anyway. Look, look into it, and I don't have any messages. This will tell me which messages are turned on and off. If you have something that, yes, I know that's the situation. I know my firewall's turned off, and I don't want this stupid message every time the computer comes on. It says, tells me what I already know. You can tell it to not send you messages about those particular things. But if you have an issue, you're going to have a little red flag down here. And it, and it will ask you to look at those at those things. Automatically launches if there is a problem in the device manager. Run it open if you can. If there is one, and what this one's what this one is saying is that yep. Download and install the driver for your laser printer. I found it. Here it is. Here is the solution for it. And Microsoft always wants to know. Was this helpful? Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. If the problem is not resolved, try the device manager and sometimes just delete the whole thing and start over. Let Windows start over with it. Again, in the one that I'm using, the one that keeps finding the wrong thing, uh, if I plugged it in and restarted it, it said, okay, I can work now. I deleted the driver, uninstalled the one that's there, said delete the driver, and it kind of does and kind of doesn't do that. The device manager, uh, and I want to want to look at it here quickly. A couple of ways to get to it is device manager, dev management.msc. Uh, MSCs are, are Microsoft uh, consoles, so D E V M G T, was that it? Uh, MSC. 
No, it wasn't. MGMT, I'll bet. Yeah. Let's try. They're, 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 just like everything, Microsoft, there are multiple, multiple ways to get to it. Okay, M MGMT, and they have MGT sometimes, MGMT. The device manager is going to give us a list of, of all the things that we have, batteries and my Bluetooth radios here. It's, it still says that I have this kind of wrong dongle in here, the Broadcom, as well as the Microsoft enumerator. The Microsoft enumerator is the problem that I've been having getting in. The computer itself, ACPI 6, X64 base, the drives, we have one, one disk drive, the display adapters, DVD, CD ROMs. The human interface devices, these are the things that always, human interface device, mouse, what it's been in the past, but now I have the Bluetooth remote control things that goes on in this thing. Keyboards, what we have, mice, HID compliant mouse. What we can also do is devices by connection, and if we do those, we're going to have a little bit different situation. The core here, the ACPI compliant, uh, the core 3.2 gig uh, when we do these things. Resources by type is going to give us the memory I.O. location. And then we have this bad driver is, is issue here. We have a little exclamation point which says there's probably going to be an issue, the Microsoft PS2 mouse. I guess that's the case because we don't have a PS2 connection. We don't have a PS2 mouse on this one. We have a uh, we have a, uh, a USB mouse. So the PS2 and the PS2 keyboard is saying, oh, we don't have a driver for it. Yes, we don't have a driver for it. And yes, we also don't have it connected. So we don't have those things. The other view, view resource by connection. Again, we get into a similar situation. And what you get into here is the I/O the I/O locations of the system itself. So there are a number of ways to look at this thing. Typically what we're going to look at is device by type so that we have these things. The action update driver uninstall, scan for hardware changes, add legacy hardware something. The legacy hardware something is if you can somehow run across a non-plug and play device you may have to add it as legacy hardware. What typically is going to happen there is you also need to let the BIOS know about it because if it doesn't, it may assign the resources to a plug-and-play device. Legacy device is not really all that available anymore. So the device manager can disable and enable update to drivers, uninstall, undo the driver update. That is, let's go back to the, go back to that thing just a second. If I had, we can update here, we can update, disable, uninstall, scan for hardware changes, and I don't want to do any of that because I don't want to mess up what I'm trying to do right now. In the driver itself, we could update the driver. If we had put in a new driver and decided all of a sudden that it's not so very great, we can roll back the driver here. It's grayed out because this doesn't, this hasn't had a driver update. Had we had another driver update, we could roll it back. You can roll back one driver. If we did a rollback, then you can't roll back from the rollback. So you can do a single driver rollback of this thing. I'm going to get this machine overloaded here in a minute. huh? <clears throat> Undo a driver update to access it. Right-click the computer. See, here we go. They say First they say do the dev management.msa. Right-click. How many different ways can you get into this thing? Let's see. We could go to Control Panel, and we could get into the device manager there, or we could right-click on the computer and go to Manage. I see. I messed that up, didn't I? Right-click, Manage. There we go. Or we could, I think we can go into Properties of it. Right-click on the computer, Properties, Device Manager. So a multitude of ways to get into the device manager. Can you do it through run? 
Yeah, with the dev management, DEVMGMT, MGMT, not MGT, dot MSC, <clears throat> through the run, through the, uh, through the combination run search bar now, as they call it. <clears throat> One bar, multiple, multiple things that you can do with it. So, you can do lots of things with it. Error messages, update drivers, uninstall, reinstall the device if it doesn't work. Uninstall, and re there's two, a couple of things that happen here. <clears throat> there is a disable the device, and one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, that'll happen over the years, uninstall and reinstall. If you have, for instance, onboard video and a, an expansion card video, and you don't want the onboard video to run, you don't uninstall it because if you uninstall it, it will reinstall the next time you start the machine. What you want to do is disable it and leave it alone. So if you want something that it's there, you just don't want it to be bothered with it anymore, you don't want it to work, disable it, don't uninstall it because uninstall it will reinstall. Uninstall and reinstall the device, update the drivers, roll back the drivers. One of the things that you may want to consider when you uninstall the device is restart the system. That way... All the changes get written back into the registry, and it can start fresh. If you uninstall, reinstall, and I think I was guilty of that with this Bluetooth disaster that I've been created for myself, I would uninstall and reinstall and say, oh, okay, that's still here. When I restart the system, it says, oh, maybe I need to find this stuff again. So uninstall, reinstall the device. Sometimes you don't need to restart, sometimes you do. If you, if you uninstall and reinstall, it still doesn't do what you want to do. Try restarting the system. Windows is kind of a funny bird about a lot of things that that it will or won't do for you. Yes? Like I have a problem at home. How would you use the device manager to pick up something when it's saying it's, it's, it's picking it up, but it's not being able to be identified? That would be a driver issue, not being able to be identified. It says, hey, there's something here, but I really don't know what it is. That's typically going to be a driver issue. Driver, it can't find one. Yeah, and it can't find one. That Then you go to the manu you gotta go to the manufacturer and then put it someplace and then right-click update drivers and then point specifically to that location to where you save that driver. Sometimes they're going to be executables and they'll put the driver in the Now put the driver in the driver's folder and Windows says, oh, got it. Magically, I found it. But that, that typically is going to be, is there something there, I don't know what it is, usually going to be a driver issue when we do those things. Not able to locate new drivers, download the dry latest, use 64-bit, 64-bit OS. And that's one of the things that's happening, that's probably one of the things that's happening to me because I told you guys that, hey, it worked on the other machine, but they updated the machine. The difference is we went from a... 32-bit operating system to a 64-bit operating system. So Windows had the 32-bit driver, but doesn't have the 64-bit driver when we do those things. You need to have the driver for the operating system that you're using, obviously. A few devices have firmware, and firmware is going to be our I knew I did that. Firmware. Let's see if I can do it. See if I can make it do it now. What is firmware? It only draws in one direction. What's firmware? Firmware is going to be like a BIOS that's on the system. Firmware is going to be something that the management capability of the card itself. Is firmware what would be on like the well, you on your router? On your router, your yeah. Uh firmware <clears throat> typically we call it BIOS, but we really update the firmware in that system. Uh SCSI controllers are typically gonna have firmware. RAID controllers will have firmware, things that you can manage that manages the system itself but actually can be updated, can be flashed that's that magic term, flash. What does that mean, flashed? Uh, erased. Erased, yes, kind of, sort of. Updated, changed, modified, flash, but we really do erase them because those devices that we use now are EEPROMs, which is really kind of a strange thing to me. 
electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. Well, if it's read-only, how come it's programmable? But we can change it. The so BIOS is now, instead of using the old true ROMs, now use EE ROMs, and that's what all these things do, electrically erasable. Issue with flashing these things, <clears throat> typically you can do damage if you if you interrupt it in the middle of them. Device di drivers properly to flash the firmware. One of the things that you want to be sure that you're getting is the correct one. Because if you put the wrong flash into that memory, you can you can destroy or ruin that particular device. And RAID control, this is a RAID controller. Again, that's one of the things that we're going to have, typically would have flash for. This is a table that's in the book, how fast are things, and we were talking about some of the drive stuff earlier. eSATA, which is an external SATA, 6 gigabits per second. Cable length 2 meters, which means that we're going to have external, right? Which kind of makes sense. That's what the E is for in the eSATA is external. We're going to have a cable outside the system. Super speed USB, USB 3.0, 5 gigabits per second, which is a long way from, if I can find it down here, from the original USB 1.1, which was 12 meg or 1.5 meg. Cable links up to 3 meters. Originally, these kind of these things kind of came on cables. You can get cables for them. Mostly, what we do today in the world is just plug them directly into the system itself. The high speed, the USB 2, is 480 meg. But again, when we go to these things. A really substantial difference between USB 3 and USB 2. Even if we plug a USB 3 into a USB 2 slot, it's going to be faster. It's not going to be 5 gig, but it's going to be faster because of the way it handles the write onto the system itself. And then we have more eSATA version 2, version 1, version 2, version 3, and we keep going up in speed until we get to the top end of these things. Firewire. 1.2 gig, Wi-Fi 802.11 and up to 500 meg. If we had AC, 802.11 AC, and there's a poster out there in the hall if you look at how it actually gets its speed, it has a theoretical speed of up to a gigabit per second wireless, which is pretty substantial. When we, when we think back to, before your day, when I think back to 300 meg, or 300 meg, 300 K, not a 300k, 33k, but we'll keep we'll keep going back until we get to 56k top end for these things. The parallel, the serial parallel, 100 or 1.5 meg, and this one's going to be the cables up to 4.5 meters, 15 feet away, 50 feet. Anyhow, you can look at those things. We go down to the really slow, which we don't really use anymore, but it is a wireless system, and you need to know that it exists infrared is one of the wireless systems that we can use. And it had speeds all the way up to 4 meg. So lots of different systems. What are you going to use? What do you want to use? eSATA, and eSATA is typically going to be for data because we're going to, pro, we're going to have to have a bootable device to start Windows on. The SATAs we can use in these things. USB, these are just the, the really kind of cool symbols of well, we have super speed, high speed. Don't you love these terms? Super speed, high. Red on red didn't work so good. And then USB, the original USB is not going to have anything. High speed is going to be, this is going to be 1, 2, and 3. USB 1, USB 2, USB 3. The implementations form uses the following symbols so that you can distinguish which is which on those things. The USB which is kind of crazy. You can have as many as 127 USB devices, daisy chain to each other, one to the other, or use USB hubs. But you can have up to 127 of these things. Uses a serial transmission, uh, it, hot swappable, and that's back to that term that we had earlier. Hot swappable means that we don't have to turn the computer off 
in order to put the device in or take the device out. And this is one of the, I think probably one of the first hot swappable devices that all of us use on a regular basis. You plug it in, you take it out. You plug it in, you take it out. You don't turn the computer off. Has four wires, two of them, and if you look at them, they do have, have two for power and two for data. And and this is diff pictures of the different sizes of the USBs. We have a male to male cable. We have a mini, and then a uh, it's a mini mini B to a, a male cable. And this one we have a, a male to a, a B male cable. Uh, this one up here typically I think I've seen for USB printers would have that connector on it. This one down here typically for cameras. Something like this down here, cameras, printers in this area. Different devices, but they all go back to the USB. They don't have a picture in here, but if you look inside one, there actually are four connectors, so it does have four wires in it. More pictures, and again, these are in the book. The micro connector, these are moderately good connectors. The micro, the micro B connector, the micro A connector, uh, USB 3 male, the USB 3 male, and on and on and on. Which connector are you going to use? One of the things that the A plus will ask you is to identify some connectors. Uh, I'll try to, to create a drag and drop practice thing for the ones that are that at least I think are the common ones that they'll ask. And, and what they'll do is they have pictures and you, you have the drag and drop connectors. Connectors are a big deal. Firewire. IEEE 1394, when you see it, hardly used in new devices. It was at one time the faster of all of the external quick quick connecting devices. Not really used all that much anymore. We have FireWire 800 and FireWire 400, 63 or 16 devices in these things. Uh, FireWire 400, two connector types, and the 800 uses a nine-pin rectangular co connector. And they have pictures of them in the book, not any really good pictures here in this presentation. Infrared, you need to know that infrared is, it's an outdated, but it also is a wireless technology. I haven't used an infrared in a long time, but I have used it. I had a laptop that had infrared, and the only thing that I've actually ever used it for is to transfer data from a phone to a hard drive so that you could have things like the pictures or the address book or those things backed up. Most common used in controls, and I don't think that even these guys are really use an infrared anymore. They are kind of an interesting thing. <clears throat> a little story, I had a TV one time that was an infrared controller. And you can tell because it had a little red window on the front of it that sat facing the sun at a particular time of the day when the sun got just at the right angle, it would just start going through the channel. wouldn't stop. The sun was actually changing the channel with these things. So light is an issue. Light can be an issue with them. The advantage to IR is privacy because it won't go through walls like wireless will. It will go through windows, but... If you want to keep a signal captured in a room, there are ways to set up an infrared networking. It's not real fast. Actually, it's real slow. But those things would do that. Simple input devices, keyboard and mouse, uh, controlled by the BIOS. We plug them in, and typically they're going to work. The keyboards actually do have, in some cases, in the old ones, they had, there was a keyboard BIOS, and now I think most of the chipset's going to control what goes on on these things, but you plug in a USB keyboard and it's a keyboard. It's there. You plug in a USB mouse and it's a mouse. It's there. If you have keyboards that have special functions on them, the Microsoft keyboard or those sorts of things, you have to put the keyboard, the driver uh, software into them. Uh, and again, to install peripheral devices, read the directions, and it's either going to be install the Driver, put the device in, put the device in, install the driver. Do whichever it tells you to do. Make sure that the port that you're using is enabled, and I don't think that that, in most cases, the port might be, but if you if you plug a device into a slot, it's probably going to be there. Install the drivers. Actually, this says, this, this, back here, this kind of, kind of 
overrides this, doesn't it? Follow the manufacturer's instruction to install the drivers and plug in the device. The, the manufacturer's directions may say to plug the device in and then install the drivers. Do, do it in whichever order the manufacturer recommends. USB or PS2, and we looked at this one, said that the PS2 wasn't there, and yes, the PS2 isn't there. These do have PS2 ports, and the reason it was saying that it had a problem with the PS2 keyboard and the PS2 mouse is because there's nothing plugged into those ports on the machine. The device driver, uh, uninstall, disable, or enable most devices. You can disable uninstall. Again, remember, if we do an uninstall, uninstall, if it's plug and play, and about everything today is plug and play, when you restart the system, it's going to reinstall it for you. So if you want it to not interfere, not be their capability, what you want to do is disable it. Uh, you may want a device to not work for an amount of time. You can disable it and then enable it, and those typically you're not going to have to restart the system. USB devices managed through the control panel. We looked at those when we looked at the control panel itself. Peripheral devices, barcoders and scanners, uh, point of sale, things that have become popular in a number of systems. One of the problems, opinion, that going to probably be around for a while is a lot of these things run on XP, and they're not supported in Windows 7. So this non-support of Windows XP can cause some issues with some of these devices that really won't run on the higher layers, higher level systems. We had years ago, not that many years ago, XP was just in the, oh, this is a pretty good system. Somebody out here had a front-end alignment software that only ran in DOS, was trying to, trying to convert it to Windows XP, and nobody can make it run on Windows XP. So some of the specialty softwares designed for a particular operating system and run in those operating systems. The interface methods, wireless, serial, USB port, keyboard port, some of them are going to use the keyboard port. Some of them will plug in the keyboard port, and then the keyboard will plug into those devices. But the devices themselves, the peripherals, have to be installed. Biometric devices, things that probably are going to become more and more and more important when we get to two-factor authentication. And one of the things that this latest hack got all the, the, the uh, nude pictures, and I'm sure that you store all of your nude pictures on the Internet in the iCloud, right? Now, you store them locally on your hard drive. But yeah, <laughs> anyhow, two-factor authentication is a big deal with banking. So what do we want? To do, and there are different methods to do that. Biometric devices on the local machines, laptops in particular, are a big deal. So that somebody steals your laptop and you have a fingerprint reader, then they can't get into your laptop because it won't start because you got the wrong fingerprint. Yes. The thing I was talking to Mr. Loomis about in an earlier class, I believe it was DOS, but he was talking to us about how people were coming off the street. I'm just getting in the library on the computers. Mm -hmm. I was asking him, how come, I've seen it, I think WVU is one of the colleges using this now, is why don't they use the same kind of method the Army uses since we have IDs and slide them into this? The reason is that we don't do that, the two-factor on our machines is we're just not that big. We're just not that big. Uh, I think Virginia Beach or one of the larger campuses is the one that really had those issues. Yeah, could they? Could they actually get on the machine? What? Just walking in. If, if I walked a stranger in here and set them out of the computer, could they log in and use it? Uh -huh. uh, log in! you got to have a username and password. What this gives is a second one, and what you're talking about, multi-factor, we're talking about multi-factor of Authentication, uh, the biometric devices, what we have in auth authentication are basically three three things that we can use. Something you know, username and password. Something you have, the card that you're talking about. And something you are, the biometric devices. Your handprint, fingerprint, retinal scan, uh, 
even handwriting, believe it or not, <clears throat> and it's not like you can forge it. What the handwriting does is it it detects different pressures that you use as you make different letters. So all of those things can be there. The biometric devices, something that we really need, can use in a high high security environment. And are we a real high security environment? I don't think so. If this was a bank, would we want biometric devices or key fobs or something like that? Absolutely. You would want two-factor authentication. If you do online banking, do you want two-factor authentication? I think the answer to that is yes, and it is available, not in the sense of biometric devices, but in the sense that I've been looking at one, you can log on, and then before you can do anything else, you tell the bank to send you a, a key. That's something that you... Something you know your username and password, something you have is the key that they send you, the, the character string. Another screen. example, like when I log into my uh, uh, USAA banking thing, I log in and then I have to answer my security <coughs> questions. You have to security questions, yeah, that would be a second factor. Other thing that they use is uh, what Bank of America uses, and I'll use them because we have a Bank of America account. They have a little picture that shows up on their website. If you go to some place and the little picture is not there, it's not their website. What that's for is to ensure that somebody didn't redirect you to a fake Bank of America website. Because it's not that hard to actually capture an entire website, download it, and make one that looks exactly like theirs. <clears throat> Except for, they, I think they call it site key. Their site key, if it's not there, then you're not at Bank of America. You're at some place that looks like Bank of America. And the two-factor, but yeah, the... The security questions, <clears throat> so you can prove who you are. The problem with security questions is a lot of them are things that they ask that are common knowledge. So you may not want to answer them truthfully. They don't care what you answer, as long as you know the answers. What's your mother's maiden name? That's something that probably is findable. What's your favorite color? You know, maybe or maybe not, but where was your mother born? Where was your father born? Those are kind of typical. Where did you go to high school? Where did you graduate from high school? What was your first elementary school? Those sound, sound so familiar for some of the questions that are there. Uh, my, the mother, father, but my question is like the mascot of my high school. Mascot of your high school. Golly, that, well, I bet we could figure that one out. Favorite college. Yeah. So, yeah, your athletic teams that you like, and those are things that are discoverable. Not immediately, but they're discoverable. So you may or may not want to answer these questions truthfully. <clears throat> but be sure you know what you answered them as so that you can get in. Fingerprint readers, we do these things, the USB. And then there are some that go into USB devices embedded on the side. The, the laptop's embedded, you slide across. One of the questions that people ask sometimes is, what if you burn your finger or something or something happens to your fingerprint? they're normally going to use more than one. You do all, you know, five, all, maybe all ten fingers, do the thumb, finger, right hand, left and hand, the so that the you know, thumb and index. The, the military uses different things with a bunch of guys that when they log on to wherever they go for their information, they uh, they have the, the, key, the uh, smart cards that they put into these things, like you were talking about. <clears throat> the reason we don't do it is an extra expense, do we do we enforce the type of security? Relatively small campus. Uh, typically, in the different locations, everybody knows who should be in a particular spot. So, is it it's it's a cost versus security uh, issue? When you get into security, you're gonna find anything that makes it secure is not gonna be very convenient, and maybe not very cheap when we do those things. Read the documentation and the SSD slots, and I think most laptops come with these things now, so that you can just plug your your uh, SSD SD slots, so that you can just plug in your uh, SD storage into the machine and take the information off of it. <clears throat> Connect it to the camera, take it out of the camera, plug it into the uh, Machine says you don't have to plug the camera in. I don't. I mean, I guess that, that is more convenient, particularly if you have more of them. But you put the memory card into the PC and get the information off of it. Other peripheral devices, webcams. 
embedded in most laptops, typically not very expensive anymore, installed in a USB port or other port, normally going to be come with come with a built-in microphone, so you're going to have those things. Uh, graphics tablets, these are things that can be handy. Of course, we have them now that all the checkouts where you sign your name and it's illegible, uh, you have to learn how to use these things. And, and uh, typically come with a USB, have a stylus, install the same way as other USB devices, it's going to have a driver. And it will incorporate into, hopefully, other softwares like uh, a Word document, Office, or whatever those things, so that you can have handwriting in those things. You could actually sign the document with a signature, not a digital signature. You can do either one. This one obviously shows that it, it does connect with, with a USB and it has a stylus here. Uh, sometimes a stylus can be used as the mouse itself. <clears throat> MIDI devices, musical devices, allows you to create music, make music on the system interface musical devices on your system if you if you want to manage uh, music through those things. And this one is, this is going to be the, the, to the device itself and then it's going to plug into your machine and we have an adapter in the middle that ties these two things together. Connect the musical instrument to a PC, MIDI to MIDI, MIDI to USB, USB to USB, and USB to MIDI. And, it, and on all this, why do we need all of these things? Because we don't know what kind of connector at any given time the device is going to have. We know that the computer is going to have a USB, so MIDI to MIDI or may have a MIDI connection. MIDI to USB, USB to USB, and USB to MIDI, so all of those things are available. Touch screens, we love them, love to hate them, whatever else, they work very well. Capacitive touch screen is a thing that's become pretty popular. The input device uses the monitor LCD panel as a backdrop for the input options. You can buy touch screens. They're coming down in price all along. But it can be installed as an add-on. We can get an adapter. What you really do is put a grid over your, uh, over your uh, monitor, and then you do the alignment. And when you touch it, what you really do is your, your touch becomes the mouse input so that we can have those things which is kind of handy. <clears throat> KVM, if you have a lot of different computers, KVM, keyboard, video, mouse, uh, keyboard, video, and, and mouse for these things. For instance, in a NOC, we have multiple servers, and we don't want to have a keyboard for every computer, or a mouse, and a monitor for every computer. We'll put in a KVM and connect them all to the KVM. We use a single keyboard and mouse and then a switching mechanism to switch to each of the devices, that we, each of the servers that we want to look at. Server testing room, if you have lots of computers and you don't want a lot of, of keyboards and mice and monitors, this is the, this is the way to go. Uh, not really all that expensive anymore. We switch between each of them and control them, control them all. Adapter cards, verify, this is this is kind of all. Verify that the card fits the empty expansion. So what kind of slot do you have? And you need to buy a card that fits it. If we only have PCIs, then we need to be uh, we need to, to buy a PCI device. The device drivers are available for that operating system. You may get into a 64-32-bit driver issue, you need to be sure that if you got a 64-bit system, you got the 64-bit drivers for that particular device. Always, and this is always going to be backup, important data not already backed up. Do we do that? Should we do that? Yes. Do we do that? Probably not. What this is saying is that you may install this device and install a driver and it will wipe out all your data. Could it happen? Yes. Will it happen? Eh, probably not. Know your starting point. The other thing that we should do here in, in the Windows world is create a restore point. And what the restore point will do is if the driver doesn't work, we can go back to a point in time. What the restore point does is gives us sort of a backup of the registry so that if we put in a driver, 
the information goes into the registry and all of a sudden it doesn't work, then we can restore it to a previous point in time and use the old driver, the old information, and hopefully get the system started back. General directions, la da 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 da. We're here with uh, where the ground bracelet. That's always going to be a case. Shut down the system, unplug the system. Be careful of static, and that's what that's all about because you really can damage these devices if you're not grounded. Locate the slot, insert, insert it, anchor the card, connect the power cords, whatever we want, start the system, listen for our beep, replace the case, start the system. They say replace the cover, start the system. I'm kind of a coward. I restart the system because I'm not sure that it's going to work. And if it, if I replace the cover and put all the other stuff on it, it doesn't work, then I've got to take all that stuff back off. If I start the system that does work, then I can put the cover and all that other stuff back on. The order there I don't think is really that big of a big of deal. Possible solutions, a whining sound, inadequate power supply, and power up. Black screen at power up. Disable the onboard port. Series of beeps that power up. Reseek the card and check the slot. The beeps, the beep codes are going to be BIOS, BIOS specific. Typically, if you have a memory issue, it's just going to be a continuous beep. Beeping just goes forever. Beep, 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 beep. Each of these things are going to send you Morse code messages, and you need you've got that. You've got to look up what each of those uh, messages are. Games crash, update the motherboard driver, update DirectX and apply. Game patches for those things. We have here uh, a PCIe single lane card that's going into the system, a sound, a sound blaster. Uh, sound cards and onboard sound can play sound. Speaker ports are color coded. Yes, we, we got that part, right? TV tuner and capture cards if you want to make your computer a TV. Uh, so you, you can, in these things, this one I think says, the book says, plug it into the cable. There are some that actually go into antennas you can get off, uh, off the air uh, television for these things. The capture card allows you to record the programs that you're seeing so you can turn your uh, machine into a DVR, basically. Video subsystems, the primary uh, device, the monitors, the video cards, video adapter, whatever we use with those things. CRT, largely obsolete. CRT is going to be high power, high heat. PWR uses lots of power. This is these are one of the reasons I think that in the power management consoles we have the ability to turn the monitor off after 15 seconds, 3 minutes, 5 hours, whatever else. The CRTs actually did use a lot of power and you wanted them off whenever they weren't working. The new ones, not so much so. LCD flat panel, first using laptops, LCD liquid crystal display. Most of them are going to be backlit now, probably backlit by LEDs, makes them nice and bright. The original LCDs, the LCD watches anyway, used, used ambient light. That's why you couldn't see them at night. They used the ambient light reflected back through the liquid crystals in order to actually cause the display. <clears throat> Software manipulates the pixels via, via electrodes, and, and this, again, typically what we're going to be using in any of these things. And this is a nice picture again in the book. What goes on on these things, a pixel is formed in the intersection of a row and a column in these things. In the old days, we used to have the dots, and I only have red here, but we have red, green, and blue dots. And these were triads, which were not necessarily a pixel, depending on what the resolution was. They could be a pixel. They could be part of a pixel. A pixel is, is a point of sound. In this, in this case, the intersection of a row and column. And one of the issues with the LCD panels is failures at a location, pixel failures. And you really don't want that 
particularly in your television, right? Plasma, high contrast, better color than LCD, expensive and heavy. I have a, because they were cheap at the time, I have a plasma 40-inch monitor. Hook it up to the cable and it becomes a 40-inch TV. The sucker weighs a ton. It takes two people to move those things. I tried to move it in my house by myself. Yeah, and you hurt your back. I did anyway. I almost dropped it. Yeah. Expensive, heavy, and and high power consumption. Those things produce a lot of heat, don't they? Yeah, I can even scrape up the top, put it off from mine, you can feel the heat off it. Yeah. Hot heat. So not only do they take the power, but then they in the, in the summer you have to have more air conditioning. Help heat the room in the winter, though. Heat is a representation of how much power anything is using. Heat dissipation in computers, obviously, is one of our big problems. So plasmas, yes, they're heavy. They tend to be cheaper, I think, when I look at the TV as the plasmas are cheaper, but you have to be careful about them. They're not as heavy as they used to be, but they're still heavy. Projectors we're using here shine the light, project on a transparent image, and a, a number of people are going to this to projectors for their televisions because they can make a, a big, big uh, scre screen when we do theirs. Organic light emitting diode. Monitor uses a thin layer LED between the two grids of the electrodes. What these things are actually doing, there's little bitty, little bitty uh, diodes in there that are actually reflecting the light to uh, to create the digital. Doesn't use doesn't use backlighting. And this is again, you can, I know you can't see it from there, but in the book, a refresh rate, screen size, pixel pitch, and on and on and on and on. The different things that can be our our characteristics or can sometimes can be changed uh, when we do those things. Refresh rate, how frequently does it refresh? And you go to buy a television, you got a 60, 60 cycle and 120 cycle, 120 hertz, 60 hertz, 120 hertz refresh rate, you want 120 hertz because it's going to be a more persistent, consistent, better, smoother picture. Yeah, 3D is, 3D gets to be a whole different situation. Video cards and connectors, uh, PCI, PCI Express, AGP, the uh, advanced graphics card. What I think, again, if we're going to see mostly is the PCI, PCIe videos can be much faster, much better video. And the newer systems don't even come with the AGP slots. PCI is the way we're going to go. Maybe, maybe. Maybe maybe some PCI, an awful lot of PCIe. Oh, PCIe, yeah. The newer, higher end, you've got a higher end machine, so that's what you're going to have. VGA, red, green, blue, VGA port, DB15. When we look at those, they're typically going to be blue in color. They're going to be 15 pins, three rows. And I think they still want this one you to be able to, to identify this one on the, the uh, A+. DVI-D, digital cable, DVI-I, analog or digital DVI-A, analog signals. So we have the different DVI, digital visual interface variants. And I don't remember, I don't think they put it in here. There are pictures of those in the book, and that's one of, one of the sets that I think that you should look at before you take the A+. What, what do each of these look like? They're going to have, they're going to be a square connector. They're going to have a little slash. And if you've got extra pins over here, we're going to have an analog. These, these would be the analog, and the digital, the digital connection would be on the other side of the system. Composite video, RGP, composite video, the three or four different uh, connectors, uh, composite video, red, green, blue, mixed together, the same signal. S video, super video. A lot of these things are still around, but not all that popular anymore. Display port is a new one, replaces the DVI. Can transmit digital and 
audio data on the system. If you look on the back of this machine that you're when we take a break, I think it you'll see that it has a display port. The reason that we could make the dual monitors quickly with what's on the system itself is it supports both VGA and uh, a display port. The new monitors had display display port connectors, so it was it was a convenient thing to make these this room into uh, dual monitors. It had some some monitors hanging around. HDMI, video and audio, preferred system in television anyway, and and it's a way to go from your uh, laptop to the to uh, a television system. So the display port here and each of these look a little bit this one the display port actually looks to me more like a firewire than it does HDMI and then the HDMI shape here each of these things when we HDMI to HDMI display port to many display ports so the display port to the many again relatively square depending on what we have in any of these things Monitor buttons adjust the size, vertical position, change the brightness, and all those things. Not a whole lot that we, that that is going to be uh, anything that you wouldn't want to do. Well, resolution is a thing that we really want on most of these, isn't it? Video memory, the GPU, also called called the video processing unit. Graphics RAM installed on the card, or it may use onboard memory the different memories that they use. The video memory on these things, and I want to take a look at a couple of things that were here. DirectX is a big deal anymore with Windows. How do you find out what your DirectX is? What version do you have? Do you have the correct version? And I didn't make this up. This is actually in the book. If we go to, and I open this up, I'm running as, a, as an administrator, and I've got the command here. I want to be sure it works on this machine for me. Since we have lots of restrictions, DX Diag will give me my DirectX. It says DirectX version 11, the drivers I can run. And this is, it runs, runs the 32-bit by default. We run the 64-bit, and it will come back up. So we have DirectX uh, 11. Page file, 2704 meg used, and on and on, some, some information here, default BIOS. This, this system uses the onboard video, but this will give you some information about what, what is going on with it. To see the video memory, let's see if I can minimize this. We've already looked at that. If I look at the screen resolution and go into advanced settings in the adapter, it'll tell me what my video memory is. Dedicated, and this one's really big, 64 meg, nothing like your gamers use. Right? 64 meg, total available graphics, 1696, shared system memory, 1632. So you can see how much video memory the system has is using and look at the DirectX uh, version that you're using. DirectX 11 is the one that, that typically is going to be used. And, and what Windows worries about is the uh, uh, the 3D effects that they that they have. Storage devices. Again, we looked at a lot of that last time when we talked about hard drives. So let's look at this really quickly. Optical discs, when we're talking about CD, DVDs, typically they're going to be uh, detected automatically. USB flash drives, plug it in, don't plug it in, memory cards, the things that we can plug into the system itself. File system manages the storage, the overall structure of the operating system. Each storage device is assigned a drive letter. Yes, it is. One of the things that you may find in a networking environment, and we run into a couple of times here, is you plug in a USB device and it appears to be there but it doesn't have a drive letter. What's happened is it got assigned a drive letter, hardware drive letter, when it got plugged in. And then when you got into the startup scripts, a map 
device overrode that overwrote that drive letter. You can go into the disk management and give it a different drive letter, and it should work fine then. If formatting, put the new file system on things that you did in DOS, NTFX, XFAT, FAT32, and FAT. XFAT, FAT32, basically the same thing. XFAT's the one that's used that, that's going to show up now. FAT will be FAT16. You're not going to see it a whole lot. FAT16, I think the last big Microsoft thing that used FAT16 was uh, Windows NT 4.0. When we look at the properties of the card, it's going to tell us how much is there, how much is used, what, the, what is available, what the file system is. And this one's FAT32. Uh, typical, typical, I did it to me, I, I did it to me again, didn't I? A typical, uh, well, we're, well, a typical flash drive, I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going to get to where I want to be here in a second, is going to use a 32-bit Maybe there we go. 32-bit, FAT32, and that's what this is saying here, FAT32 uh, file system. What that means if we use that, that, that's the way they come by default. The reason we use the FAT system is it has less overhead than NTFS. If you have a large flash drive, a large external hard drive, uh, NTFS is the way that you really want to go because that's that's where all your security is. Similar technologies, lands and pits, and laser beam to, to do these things. The file system, CD drive uses a CDFS, compact disk file system. DDVD uses the UDF, the universal disk format. <clears throat> external might use a eSATA firewire or USB, and this is the way how it's going to connect externally to the system. Is is all that represents. This is kind of an interesting slide here. How much do each of these things hold? The CDs, when they came out, boy, we were we had lots of storage. We were already up to 700 meg. And now when we get down here to the double-sided Blu-ray, we're up to 50 gig on these things. Still not something that you want to use for backup. When we talk about backups, we probably still want to use tape or, in my humble opinion, replicate off-site someplace because it's going to be slow 50 gig when you start backing up in a networking environment you're probably going to be backing up terabytes worth of information not not gigabytes worth of information some nice things put the labels on of uh, where you where we can write on the top of these things you have to buy the, the CD DVDs that support it have the software that supports it yes it's really nice I've always found a, uh, you know, the old the old fashioned method to do that. Installing these things, the hard drive, optical drive, must share a cable, make the hard drive the master, and that goes back to the PETA, right? Where we had a master slave, PETA or EIDE. -E. So the hard drive should be the master, and the optical drive should be the slave. If they're on the same cable, you really don't want them on the same cable because they they share the transfer capabilities. Like, and I always talk think about cables. If you think about them as highways or interstates or whatever else, how many devices, how many stores are you going to have? You don't want two big stores on the same two lane highway if you can't avoid it. Usually installed in the top bay. You know, where are they going to do? And, and this is this is things that you can read in in the book. Windows found a new device, and you, do you want to install it? Yes. Solid state storage, SSD, flash drives, memory cards, and now uh, the, well, obviously the SSD hard drives, all of the things that we're going to use for these things. Uh, a lot of different things: flash drive, pen drive, jump drive, thumb drive, key drive, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uses FAT or uses typically going to use the FAT file system. If you lose the information on these things, there is a piece of software that's not all that expensive called Get Data Back that typically will recover that. It 
is something that, and there are others, it's just the one that I've used. Uh, I've recovered a lot of data. I had a hard drive that just lost all of its, an external hard drive that lost all of its partitioning information. <laughs> Disappeared of, a, of 200, let's see, I recovered 190 gigabytes, all but one file, off of the system. So, can you? Yeah. Do you want to have to do that? No. That's what backups are all about, or replication. Solid state, all of the things that we use, uh, the digital digital cameras, tablets, phones, MP3 players, digital recorders, on and on and on and on. That's <clears throat> typically we're going to use solid state storage. The solid state devices in, in the computer systems themselves, Yes, is where we want to go because, yes, they're going to be much faster. <clears throat> yes, they do fail, so you need to be careful about them. The Secure Digital Association is responsible for the standards, uh, the regular, the SD high capacity, and X, uh, SD extended capacity on these things. Different speeds, and I found out how much the speeds really matter when I bought a pretty good digital camera and had to get a high-speed card, and you can just keep going with the pictures where the old ones, you, you have to wait and wait and wait, but the, but the, but the uh, continuous shoot on it became much better. Pictures of each of these things, the SD card, the original, the mini SD, micro SD, high capacities, they all look, the the regular ones look the same, they look very similar, and you, you just have to know what you're getting on each of those. Yes. With the solid state, you know, you said there's the little memory thing. Yeah. Did you consider there's like a built-in SD? No, what little memory thing? Like on the, on the solid state drive, we have little squares. Oh, that's that's the actual chips. That is the that that is the storage areas themselves. Would those just be like is there like a built-in SD? Well, yeah, those are the flash drive. The SD the the SD is a is a format, and this is this is an SD. A flash is the long, narrow thing that we use. And if you take it apart, there's a little bitty chip on it, and that's what your flash storage actually is. So those little chips that you see are actually either the, the management chips or the storage itself that you see on the thing. That's where, that's where the information goes. But the SD is just going to be the format. And if you took this thing apart, it's going to have a chip on the inside of it. Uh, the compatibility is backward compatible, and again, you can look at those in the book. So we're up to the point that you thought we'd never get to. The whole trick to this one, we're going to spend an hour or so on this, and what it basically says is read the manufacturer's book and put it in the way, <coughs> way they say to do it. Some of them want, the, again, the driver first, and then some of them want the device installed in the driver, whichever order that they wanted in. We looked at some of the I.O. ports, <clears throat> what goes in, the way we connect things, and stated the obvious, when you go to buy an expansion card, be sure you buy the type of expansion card that has the slots that are supported by your computer. Wireless connections, <clears throat> 802.11 ABG and N, 802.11 AC is the new standard, which is much faster, and also at this point in time, much very expensive. Bluetooth Bluetooth actually is part of the 802.11 standard. Just a shorter range. Infrared, you know that it exists, not really used a whole lot anymore. If you if you need absolute privacy in a wireless world, infrared would be the way to go, but you're going to have a much slower device if you do that. The USB connectors, the original, the ones and twos and the threes, what those things looked like uh, as, as we went through those things. Installing devices, 32-bit, one of the keys is to have the, the driver that you need. If you have a 64-bit system, we want the 64-bit drivers. 32-bit system, 32-bit drivers. Biometric devices, biological data, we talked a little bit about why you would want to use those things in, in authentication. It's something that you are, which is really difficult to replicate. They always talk about, you know, if they really want it, they'll just cut your finger off. The good, the good biometric devices detect things like a pulse and temperature and those sorts of things, too. The guy one time said temperature, oh, we'll just put it in the microwave for a while. That's probably not going to work. Typically, Windows 
as well as Linux is going to detect any changes in the system. Windows, we focus on on this thing. Linux is also plug and play, uh, and it works. They've they've now gotten Linux where it works pretty much like Windows. So it, it's you know it's just just it's just about become something else. It obviously uses internally operates differently, but from a plug and play standpoint, very much so. Video ports, the DVI, DVI, DVI-D, those things. Take a look at those. The file systems, file systems. I spent a whole lot of time on, presuming that most of that was covered in, in DOS. And if it's not, you will do file system in the Windows systems, and then in the Windows. Next time we'll look at NTFS. NTFS is the file system that you want to use because it's the only one that really has that really has. You don't want that has any security. FAT has no security at all. And then flash memory, we looked at a couple of those things. The SDs, and SD is typically going to be what's going to go into your digital camera. It could be an external storage or someplace. But the storage that we carry around is typically going to be on a flash drive, thumb drive, whatever, one of those multitude of words that you can use to describe these things. Questions? No questions. You ready for a break? Take a break.